Good afternoon, Nampo. Indeed, uh, the report has been released uh, detailing some of the findings and recommendations and, of course, uh, some appalling conditions uh, which include pregnant women having to sleep on the hospital floor uh, and as well as uh, the hospital you know, functioning without a blood bank and uh, laboratory services as well. But just to you know, hear more on that, I'm now joined by Professor uh, to hear what exactly uh, you know, prompted these investigations, uh, Prof. Well, uh, a member of parliament from the Portfolio uh, Committee on Health, uh, Ms. Ismail, uh, brought these uh, complaints to, to our office. And this followed, I think, a relative of hers who was pregnant and was taken to that hospital to deliver. And that's where I think uh, everything was revealed. And uh, I think they reported to her and she brought it to her attention. And we assessed it uh, and felt that we needed to actually uh, put on our boots and jackets and go and do a proper thorough investigation. As I say, it took us almost uh, 11 months, uh, almost uh, 11 months, uh, what, uh, seven days to, to do this investigation so that we could be thorough. And you said you interviewed um, 11 people, no, Actually, 34. I mean 34 people. What um, a, a picture uh, did you get, you know, from uh, these people? Well, we got a picture of people who felt that their hospital had been neglected. It was unsafe to work in that hospital and that environment and it was uh, dirty and uh, it exposed them uh, to various you know infections that are spread by basically being felt i mean to be working in an environment where sewage is uh, moving in pipes within the hospital to work in an environment where the toilets are blocked to work in an environment where paint is peeling all over the place and uh, you sometimes see some little animals uh, crawling around in that environment it cannot be good first of all for the dignity of the personnel staff that's working there but also just for their well-being i mean who wants to wake up in the morning be energetic to go and expose themselves to such an environment. I think that's what we found. It's actually scary for a hospital to uh, operate without a blood bank because then in situations where you know patients need blood, do they resort to the alternatives? Do they have uh, those monofe infusions? And if not, um, what? Well, they, they rely, I think, on, on the fact that I think there are several hospitals around where they can always, I suppose, call for help. But that's not how, in the 21st century, a, a highly specialized hospital should function where mothers who get operated, mothers who deliver babies, mothers who have got a, a risk to be bleeding cannot have a blood available just within the campus of the hospital. They've got to go somewhere, they've got to phone, and all that takes time, and it puts patients at risk. Uh, I, I'm not sure, I'm not aware how many people would have actually succumbed or would have uh, died from such uh, risks where maybe they would have called and they didn't find blood, and I really, yeah, it's quite scary, as you say. The report also highlighted the lack of security in that uh, hospital yeah. where doctors uh, you know, just get marked and cars uh, stolen. Um, uh, what kind of a situation is that and really how are people you know, coping under those circumstances? Well, they're, they're just terrified. They're just terrified. I mean, when I had never been to coronation, when I drove there, I suddenly, my alert bells went up because I wasn't sure that I would not be hijacked or I would not be marked. And when I entered the hospital, I made one decision, no relative of mine would go to Rahima Musa Hospital. That's, that's the decision I made. And if I was sick, I would only be taken there if I was unconscious. If I'm conscious, I wouldn't go there. And we also understand uh, from your report, the CEO only reporting 482 days. Um, all this while, what, what, what happens? 
Well, as I have said to all of you, I think the, the CEO does have a condition that requires I think, attention all the time, a condition that I think cannot uh, cope with stress, and that's where the problems are. And the environment in which she was working, as she said to me, that she was not supported uh, across the board, and she found it very stressful. Now you can imagine you are in an environment that is not supportive to your leadership and uh, you have a condition that is uh, prone to be stress induced and uh, you break down quite often and uh, don't know what to do and uh, obviously when she was in those situations she didn't know who to appeal to because there was nobody who was actually giving her support and that that was the problem and you've uh, just handed over the report to the to the minister. Um, what are your expectations uh, from here going forward? Well, my expectation is that uh, the recommendations that I made will be implemented. There is a process of that that is uh, outside me. Uh, it starts with the CEO of the OHSC, it starts with the MEC of Health, it starts with the Premier in Gauteng, and then it will elevate to the Minister of Health and his, uh, his uh, group. So we expect from now implementations. I think what I want to make is that the recommendations we, we made are not extraordinary. These are basic recommendations that you should find in a hospital. That there is a blood bank, there are laboratories, the good staff complement, the hospital is clean, and the hospital has maintenance. All these are not, we're not asking for anything. We're not looking for a Rolls Royce. We're just asking for a VW. That's all. Thank you, sir. Um, no, but there was a uh, health ombudsman, Professor Malhapuru Makoba, and that's back to the studio.